And I'm excited and a little bit nervous to be here in the United States today. My first trip stateside, uh, my first Cassandra summit. And today I'm going to be talking to you about Cassandra at Halo. And when I, when I proposed this talk, um, I, I kind of, that's as far as I took it really. I just thought I will come and talk about my use case. I'll figure out the details later. And then when it came to the point when I was actually writing my slides, uh, I was having some difficulty kind of formalizing the talk. And I think the reason behind that was that the kind of story of Cassandra at Halo is actually really straightforward. And the story really is that it just works. Cassandra is something that we use and we don't have to put a lot of energy into using it, and we don't really thinking about it too much. So from a, from a Cassandra perspective, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but from a talk perspective, um, it made my life slightly hard. And this hasn't always been the case. I'm from the UK, I'm from London, and I started using Cassandra back in uh, 2010. And back then, we were using version 0.6. And I think it's fair to say that in those days, Cassandra was not something that you could just use. Cassandra was something that you needed to work at. Cassandra was something that you needed to put a reasonable amount of energy into to keeping it running, keeping it running smoothly. So that led me to start the meetup group in, in, uh, in London. It's the, the, the longest running Cassandra user group in the world. That's my claim to fame. Um, and when I founded this group, the motivation really was to try and find some people who were, who were using this database in 2010 who could pretty much tell me how to use it. Um, that, that was my motivation. And back then, a common theme of the user group was kind of war stories. It was people would come and tell their tale about how they got burned and how it blew up on them. Um, and, and we learned and we went forward. So fast forward to today, 2013. And it's, it's quite impressive, really, to think how far Cassandra has come in that time. Uh, now we're on version 1.2. And I think Jonathan's talk yesterday kind of really brought it home to me just how many new features uh, are coming uh, in you know, version 2.0. And, and really just how much has been achieved by the, the kind of team, the, the Apache team, and all the people who've contributed code. Um, so, and that's not me. So thanks to those guys for, for that effort. Um, so yeah, so that leaves me nowadays with a database that I, I haven't really had to think about in the same way that I would have done, say, in 2010. And that, that was kind of got me thinking about my talk, because back in 2010, you know, a good Cassandra talk would usually involve some pain and some, some real effort to get the thing working, whereas nowadays we don't really have that. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to use the talk as a kind of opportunity to, to do a bit of a retrospective on our, our use of Cassandra at Halo. And I'm going to talk about the adoption, of the process of how we got this technology into our organization. And I'm going to look at it from three perspectives. I'm going to look at it from the perspective of the development team, from the operations team, uh, and from the perspective of management. And to kind of research this, this talk, I, I, went and I made an effort to go and talk to these groups of people in the organization. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the developers. I'm, on, I'm in sort of box one. Um, and kind of the people in the operational team I have some contact with, uh, and management increasingly less so. So that was quite a valuable experience for me to go and talk to these people. So before I get started on, on kind of on Cassandra, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Halo. Um, Halo is the, the taxi magnet. It's uh, an app that runs on your iPhone or Android. And at the press of a button, you can hail a licensed taxi to come and pick you up. So this is uh, in London. And all you have to do is hit the button, say, pick me up here. A taxi will come, come and get you. Um, you'll be able to see the taxis. You'll be able to see the driver en route. And when you get to your destination, you can just get out the cab, safe in the knowledge that it will be charged against your registered card. So that's kind of Halo in a nutshell. We're, we're making it really easy to get a cab. Um, and to give you some kind of context to the, the sort of technology platform that we, we operate and we, we built, um, Halo's come a, a long way since November 2011, where we, when we launched in London. It's now the world's highest rated taxi app. We've got over 10,000 five-star reviews. Now, we've got over half a million registered passengers. 
and a halo e hail is accepted around the world once every four seconds. Um, so, we, so we've come a long way. And that's kind of, you can see that in the, the cities we operate in. We now operate in 10 cities globally, um, from Tokyo to Toronto. So it's, it's a, we, we've made a lot of progress. And that's, and that's not the end of the story either. So Halo is a company that's growing, and we, we really have global ambitions. Um, right now, Halo is a marketplace that is facilitating 100 million in run rate transactions. Uh, and we've raised uh, $50 million from some of the world's best venture funds. And we're using that money to expand more. So with that in mind, um, we'll start to look at Cassandra and how we, how we ended up with Cassandra at Halo. When we launched in November 2011, um, we, we didn't use Cassandra at that point. Halo was a, a, a platform that was built by quite a, a small number of people, uh, a team of three or four back-end engineers. And we had two sort of web applications based on um, PHP and MySQL. And we had uh, just kind of Java back-end to do most of the heavy lifting. Um, we used, for, for single availability zone resilience in AWS, we were using multi-master replication. So why did we end up using Cassandra? What, what was the motivation behind adopting Cassandra? Well, before launch, the focus of Halo was all about features. We needed to get the platform ready to deliver the core experience of Halo in London. Um, and once we'd launched, we, we had a slightly different focus. We knew we wanted to expand globally, and we knew we wanted to become a utility. So we wanted, we wanted this like, really resilient and reliable system. We wanted Halo to always work. So if you wanted to get a taxi, we wanted to be able to get you a taxi. We didn't want to have any downtime. We didn't want to have any, any periods where we were, we were having difficulty. So that kind of desire for greater resilience seemed to be a good fit with Cassandra's design and its kind of high availability characteristics. The international expansion plans uh, seem to be a good fit for Cassandra's global multiple data center replication. Um, and then we had some, we had, you know, we had expected growth. We were, we were going to invest in marketing. We, we had plans for this global expansion. So we wanted a database that wouldn't get in the way of those plans. We wanted something that would support the company as it grew. Um, and the fact that Cassandra scales linear, linearly for reads and writes um, seemed a good fit for that. And then finally, we had prior experience. So I, when I joined Halo in 2010, I'd already, uh, no, sorry, 2011. I joined Halo in 2011. When I joined, I'd already been using Cassandra for about a year. Uh, so I could bring that experience with me, and that was, that was, um, that was useful in, in kind of being able to choose technology and kind of know that it would probably deliver what we wanted it to deliver. So the path to adoption of, um, of Cassandra was was a largely a, a kind of unilateral decision. It was, it was really developer-led. This was back in the days when we were running out of a boat on the Thames. Um, we had quite a small office. We were all in the same room. And we, we, we sort of, the development team decided to adopt it fundamentally. Um, the way we went about kind of bringing it into our architecture was that we, we took the PHP MySQL web apps and we, we broke down the functionality that they provided into independent services that did kind of one job well. And those services, we, we used Cassandra for the data store. And then slowly, we, we started to sort of plug, repl you know, hollow out the functionality of those, the web apps and replace them with this, these services, the kind of SOA. Um, and we did, uh, the, the, the launch path was that we, we, we were just starting to launch in the US. And so the first thing we did was we ran all of our US operations out of Cassandra um, for, for the core customer data and some of the other stuff that needed to be global. Um, and then slowly but surely, we switched over the other cities that were already launched, which were Dublin and London, until we were all running off this platform. So the development perspective. Um, the overall feeling from the team is that it just works, I think, um, and that it's, it's easy to interact with, and it just kind of gets the job done. You don't have to think too much about it. We've got two main use cases for Cassandra. Um, we've got entity storage and time series data. And I'll, I'll just sort of give you a flavor of, of, of how, they, how they match up and, and how, we use, how we use Cassandra. So this is an example of uh, entity storage. This is our, um, we, we store our customer details in Cassandra. Um, 
So we use the row key here is a 64-bit integer, and we're using a kind of snowflake style, globally unique uh, number generation. And then the column names, so things like created timestamp, email, they're, they're the Cassandra column names. And then the values are the actual property values. So this is kind of an oft-used pattern. It's quite a straightforward way of using Cassandra. Um, we have one row per record, and they get distributed around the globe, which is quite nice. The main consideration for this use case is, is to make changes on a column-by-column -column basis. So if you, if you want, you know, when someone in the app updates one piece of information, we make a mutation into Cassandra to just update that one field. What you don't want to do is you don't want to read the whole record, change one thing, and then write the whole record back. Because if you do that, you have the potential for race conditions, so effectively one thing overwriting another. Whereas by just changing the one column, you, you avoid that. You're basically saying, you know, set this piece of information. This gives you an idea of the, the kind of read and write workload that we're doing. Um, this is just one of our kind of entities, and this is the, the customer entity. And you can see the rates are quite low, so we're peaking at about 50 reads a second, um, and the write rate's really low. So this kind of gives you an indication that we're not really using Cassandra because we have a big data problem or even a really you know, high volume problem. We're using Cassandra for other reasons. Um, the second pattern that we're, we're using is, is kind of the time series data. This is kind of the, the bread and butter of Cassandra, really. A lot of people will be using this. And this is one example. This is um, us storing our, um, our communications history in Cassandra. So when you, when, you, when you take a journey, we'll be sending you messages, potentially SMS messages, emails. And we keep a record of those um, for things like customer service and so that customers can request a, you know, us to send them a copy of the receipt and things like that. And so what we're doing here is we're storing all the information under one row. So here, the, the, day, the date is the row key. So 2013-06-01, that's the row key. And for, in each day, we're storing all of the emails sent, all of the messages sent under that one row. Um, the column name here is a time UUID, so that's a type one uh, globally unique identifier. And baked into that, it has the concept of when it was generated. And Cassandra can understand these, so Cassandra will be able to order the, order the um, columns um, by time. So what you end up with is we end up with one row that contains all of this stuff sent, ordered by time. So we can query it in a way to say, get me things sent between these two time ranges. We also denormalize on write. So here we're, we're doing another time series. So it's the same information here, but we've got a different row key. So instead of storing everything for the day under one row, we're storing everything sent to me um, forever. And, and this kind of works out for us because the volumes aren't that high. So we're not expecting to send millions and millions of messages to people. We're, you know, we're going to keep it quite small. And that kind of leads into the, um, the key considerations for time series. This is an example of the, the kind of read and write workload we're doing for, for this particular the, the communications case. Uh, this, this workload, we've got a slightly higher um, write rate, which is the, the green line, than, than read. So it's kind of flipped around. And, and you can see it kind of follows, uh, that's our sort of pattern of use when you know, we have rush hour and busy in the evenings and stuff. We do have higher volume streams. So this is, um, this is our stats kind of event stream. And you, this is a time series data as well. This is, this is sort of, um, this is our kind of higher, highest uh, volume data. And with this, we're peaking at around 5,000 uh, write operations per second. Uh, and the read, you can see the read rates are really sporadic. This is a kind of reporting system that we use. Um, and you can see that this is fr on Friday. There's, there's a sort of some, some general traffic, you know, people requesting stuff out of our platform. And then at the weekend, it kind of disappears. It goes down to nothing. So that's kind of, this kind of shows um, uh, uh, our highest volume case. So we, we do have some, some data that's, that's, you know, it's not all really low volume. So the key consideration for time series really is to choose the row key carefully. Because um, what, what you don't want to do is you don't want to put all of you know, if you, all the records in one row. Um, with our use case, it kind of works because we're denorm denormalizing on write. So generally, one record will update three or four different rows. Um, and we're, we're storing a sensible number per row. If you were writing you know, a million every second, then you wouldn't store them under a day 
row key because you'd end up with really, really wide rows. You want to try and partition them a bit more carefully. So that's kind of, that's really the key consideration for time series. The client libraries we're using at Halo, we're using the Astynax um, Java client, which is the Netflix open source project. We're using PHP Casa for PHP, and we're using Gossy for Go. We're not using CQL at the moment. We, we're kind of using the, the kind of older style thrift-based you know, RPC clients. Uh, and for us, that, that seems to suit what we're doing right now. Um, we, we might move to CQL in the future, potentially. Uh, I think there could be some advantages, especially around kind of in, in inducting new developers. But right now, we're using the kind of thrift-style RPC clients. So the, the other sort of half of our use case at Cassandra um, is, is analytics. One of the things we lost when we migrated data to Cassandra was the ability to, to conduct queries of, the, of the, the sorts of queries that you'd say, you know, count this, calculate the sum of this, or average, uh, with a group by clause. So that's something we did a lot of in the PHP MySQL web app. So we'd have, you know, analytics to be able to, um, you know, count how many jobs a driver had done or how many jobs a customer had done. And the migration to Cassandra meant that we kind of lost that ability because Cassandra doesn't have that ability to, to say, select count star or sum the other. So we use a product called Acuna Analytics, which kind of gives us that facility back. Um, we define, we kind of predefine query templates, which basically says we, we, we have to know ahead of time how we want to query it. And then Acuna will write all the data to Cassandra and denormalize it massively on write such that we can query it in real time. So we quite like this because the integration is very straightforward for us. It just gives us this facility without us having to really work at it. Um, so we, we find that very helpful. This is kind of an example of what, what we can do with this tool that we wouldn't be able to do with Cassandra. So this is um, a, a kind of query language that's specific to Akunu called AQL. And you can see, you know, if you've ever done any SQL, you'll kind of recognize what, what we're doing. And if you've ever used Cassandra, you'll recognize that you wouldn't be able to do this with raw Cassandra. Uh, this facility just doesn't exist. Um, and we can do things like, you know, group by different time periods and stuff. Uh, and one of the features that we're just kind of um, starting to explore is the kind of dashboard side of it. So this is relatively new, and, and we're kind of using this to give us some operational insight into whether Halo is running, really. Um, so this is an example of us sort of plotting um, customer demand over time. And one of the, the newest dashboard features is the kind of the, the geographic heat maps. So Halo is a, you know, most of our data is geographic in nature. We have customer demand at a specific location and kind of driver supply at a specific location. Uh, and one of, the one of the newer features that we're just kind of starting to get into is the ability to kind of get a feel for, for that on, on a map. So that's quite handy as well. So the challenges of adoption. This is the main one, really. Um, people joining our team, people joining our company would generally come with a, a back history of SQL experience. So, you know, it, generally people will just have 10 years experience of MySQL or something. Um, Cassandra experience is, is unlikely. I, I don't think anyone has joined our company with prior Cassandra experience. So that's a challenge. That's something that we have to kind of work around and mitigate. And I think that kind of leads on to the second point, which is that some people can shoot themselves in the foot. And I think that's kind of true with SQL as well, in that you, know, you, can, you can structure your data badly, you can create terrible indexes, you can make your database perform poorly. But I think the, the kind of natural base level of experience with MySQL or, or the SQL solutions means that people generally avoid that. You know, unless you're a very, very new developer, you're generally going to avoid that. Whereas perhaps with Cassandra, because they don't have that experience, because they're coming at it fresh, there is the potential for people to shoot themselves in the foot with Cassandra. Um, things like you know, secondary indexes, Cassandra, people keeping the SQL mindset and not denormalizing enough on write. Some of those things, trying to join stuff. Um, so we have to kind of guard against that. So some of the lessons learned on the development front. Well, one of the things that I think is really important is to have an advocate in the team. And, and I've kind of taken that role in our company, but perhaps I haven't been quite as on it as I should have been. I think it's important to try and get everyone on board. You know, you've got people joining the company continuously. You need to kind of sell them the dream. 
you need to tell them, you know, explain the tool, tell, tell them what's going on, and, and kind of enthuse them into using it. Because if you don't, then they'll probably shoot themselves in the foot with it. Um, learn the theory. In my mind, this is, this is a really important point. Um, I think it's CQL can kind of encourage an SQL mindset. You, it, it's good in one way because you can, you can get people on board quicker because the way they interact with the database is closer to how they used to use SQL. But at the same time, it's, it's kind of dangerous because I think it's important with Cassandra to understand, understand the underlying storage engine, you know, understand about the kind of co-location of data and, and understand kind of you know, how, how to play to its strengths, you know, denormalizing and stuff like that. So we make a real effort at Halo to try and share this stuff. Um, and I think you have to make probably more of an effort than you would with other storage engines because it's so new. So we try and get people to you know, come to the meetups and to learn the theory. And we try and do things like peer reviewing data models to make sure people aren't doing anything crazy. So I think Jonathan gave a good example of that yesterday, which was the, the kind of queue example where you, you have a durable queue and every time you read the next one off it, you're kind of reading 10,000 tombstones. It's that sort of thing that just getting someone who's used it a bit more to look at it will avoid. All right, so next up, the operational perspective. I think the overall feeling from the team is that Cassandra has allowed a very small team of operations people to achieve things they wouldn't have considered before it existed. So the main thing, the main kind of point here is about the kind of global active active replication and the fact that we can do that with a really small team. This is Halo, this is where we operate at the moment. We've, we've got offices on the ground here and we've got people doing stuff. So we're in, we're all the way from Tokyo and Osaka, obviously London where we started in Dublin we're down in Madrid and Barcelona in Spain, and then we're over in the US uh, and Toronto, uh, Canada, Montreal, Washington, Boston, New York, of course, we've just launched there. So there's, there's a lot of places, um, and you can kind of get a feel for why the replication story of Cassandra is so important for us now. This is kind of what our setup looks like. We run two clusters of Cassandra in production. Each cluster has six nodes in, every, in each region. And we're in, we're fully on AWS, so we're in AP Southeast One, which is the Singapore region. That's to service Tokyo traffic and you know, the Japan market. We're in US East One, which is Virginia, which covers off North America. And we're in EU West One, which covers off Europe, basically. The, we've separated our clusters into two. We've got a stats cluster and an operational cluster. We've done that because the operational cluster is, is the thing that's needed to get a taxi. If this cluster stops working, our app stops working. The top cluster is less important. It's not on the critical path. So we've, we've sort of split out the use cases and the workloads really to isolate you know, potentially huge volumes of data being ingested in the, in the stats cluster, taking out the operational side of things. And we haven't, there will be a third data center for the stats cluster, but we haven't quite got around to doing that migration yet. Each of our regions, we're operating in a, a Amazon virtual private cloud, and we're using open VPN links between the, the VPCs to, to connect them. We're using M1 large machines at the moment with provisioned IOPS, so we're, we're sort of paying Amazon to give us guaranteed um, levels of IOPS. So we're running on EBS, which is, I guess, quite unusual. Most people aren't running on EBS. The operational cluster, we're looking at about 100 gig a node at the moment, and the stats cluster about 600 gig. This is with compression. We only just recently turned on compression. I've got a slide about that in a second. The way we do backups is reasonably caveman. We've, we take SS table snapshots. We were then uploading these to S3, but we found that that was kind of saturating all our network bandwidth and causing issues. So now we just take EBS snapshots of the SS table snapshots, and that's instant. Um, so this is kind of one of the reasons we use EBS is, is that kind of ability to, to take snapshots quickly. We're not using uh, any sort of clever tool like any of the Netflix tools that, that allow us to do smarter things. Perhaps we will in the future. Encryption was a requirement for our New York City launch. Um, the regulations in NYC put, put in place a, a sort of huge uh, number of things we had to do be, to be able to launch there. And one of the things we had to do is we had to encrypt all data at rest. 
So all of our EBS volumes are encrypted with DMcrypt. We chose that because uh, the operations guys chose it because it's quite uncomplicated, apparently. I don't know anything about it, really. And the test that we did suggested that it added like a 1% IO performance hit. So it's, it's quite manageable, really. <clears throat> we use Ops Center, which is the data stacks tool. We use the free version. And the Ops guys are quite, um, quite in enthusiastic about it as a tool. We feel that it kind of gives new staff an easy in on kind of getting to grips with what Cassandra is, how it operates. And it's kind of the, the, just the ability to have these simple, you know, the simple screens of data that tell you what, what's going on. So the, it's, a, it's a kind of quick win. It's a free thing you can install and use. Multi-DC, this is kind of the main, one of the main motivations for, for, for our adoption of Cassandra. And it's really the, the big success story that we think of Cassandra is that we were able to, you know, when we, when we launched our Singapore region, all we had to do was bring up some machines and sort of type a few things in and it was, it was online and active. You know, zero downtime and it's been rock solid. We haven't had any problems at all with it. We read and write at local quorum consistency level and in order to kind of make that work, we use, um, we use narrow repairs on schedule to go around the nodes just to make sure that all the data is, um, is in sync. So that's kind of, if you went to Jason Brown's talk yesterday, he was talking about repair to make sure that any inconsistencies are dealt with. So we do that on kind of a rolling, um, a rolling nature around the cluster each night. We, we've recently started to use compression. So we were at the point where our stats cluster was running at about one and a half terabytes per node. And obviously, with Cassandra, you need, you need sort of 50% headroom to be able to do the major compaction. So we, were, we needed sort of three terabytes a node, which was, uh, I think it was actually more than we had available. And at that point, we didn't really want to add more nodes. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later with the management perspective. But we, did, we, didn't want to, we didn't want to scale this out, for, really for cost reasons. So we, we thought we'd try out compression, just see what happened. And we, t we just turned it on. It was very straightforward, and it just worked. And it gave us enormous savings, really. We're down to sort of 600 gigabytes per node now. Um, it was very easy to accomplish, and we just ran node tools, upgrade SS tables to kind of apply the compression to all the historical SS tables. So lessons learned operationally. Um, I think the main one is that Cassandra doesn't demand a lot of your attention. It certainly doesn't demand a lot of our attention. Um, anyone who's, I don't know if anyone's used, anyone's used Cassandra a lot, but this is a view of ops center of our stats cluster. And uh, as an operations person, you kind of want to see the circles to be the same size, and you don't want to see lots of streaming going on. So this cluster shows circles that are very much not the same size and quite a lot of streaming going on. But this cluster still works. This is still carrying on soldering on fine. I, when I took this screenshot for the presentation, it, I was, didn't realize that our cluster was kind of so out of balance, really. So the point is that, you know, I, I think at, the, at, the, at where we are as a company now, we probably need to invest a little bit more upfront in Cassandra. You know, Cassandra's been very good to us. We haven't put a lot of energy into it, and it's repaid that by just working. But we're probably at the point now we need to be, be a little bit more proactive. We need to kind of be a bit more you know, searching out these things and fixing them before they hurt us. So finally, the management perspective. Um, and this is kind of the one that I think is, is kind of was the biggest eye-opener for me when I was preparing this presentation. It, it's not something as a developer that I've really thought about before the presentation. And the, the management perspective is that this is, this is a quote from one of our, from our um, VP operations. And he was kind of saying, the days of the quick and dirty are over. And his point really was that, that technically our management believe that Cassandra is a perfectly fine solution. You know, they're technically very good. They can understand why it's attractive as a, a solution for developers. But they do have concerns. The management do have concerns about our adoption of Cassandra. And I think that boils down to kind of two main areas. So the first main area is really about there is a concern that we're putting a lot of data into a data store and we can't get it back out. And that's the perception from management. So that I'm not saying, I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, there, are, there are ways of querying Cassandra um, in a kind of you know, ad hoc. You could run, um, if you're running DSE, you can just run Hive. 
If you want to bake it yourself, you can run Hadoop Hive. But the perception amongst management is that we can't as a company and that we've, we've chosen this technology that basically mean, that we can't query. Um, and I guess as developers, we focused on the operational side. We focused on, we're a taxi app, you need to get a taxi, you know, we're gonna focus on that use case. And we've, we've, we haven't necessarily considered the management use case of, you know, I wanna get some data out. And what that's meant is that when we were all in one room on, on our boat on the Thames, management could pretty much go up to any member of the team and say, hey, how many da 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 And then they'd be able to type a quick SQL query and answer the question. And with Cassandra, they, they can't do that. The number of people who are able to accomplish that diminishes. There is a kind of caveat to this, which is that actually our relational data is at the point now where you can't really do that either because uh, we've got, we've got um, a lot of data still in relational data stores. We're slowly migrating. And actually that data, you know, it's at the point now where you can quite easily lock tables and take, make, make problems for production by running queries against it the sorts of things that we would have been able to do a while back. So the second point is, the second kind of concern is, is are we causing ourselves a big data problem without really thinking about it? So this is, for anyone who recognizes this, this is a map of London. And this is drawn simply by plotting points that drivers have sent us. So part of our operation is that as drivers drive around, they send us their location updates. And we use that to allocate the nearest taxi driver. And we store all of those points that have ever been sent in Cassandra. And we've got somewhere between, I, I really don't know how many, somewhere between five and 10 billion would be my guess. And this is like a very small slice of those points, just in one city, plotted on and plotted to draw a map. And I guess the management question is, are we causing ourselves a problem? Is there a business value in storing this data? And that kind of leads back to my point earlier about our stats cluster where we got up to the point where we had 1.5 terabytes per node in a 12 node cluster. And it's, it's costing us money to store that. And the question is, are we, getting a, are we getting business value for storing that data or are we doing it for no reason? And I think from the development background, there's a danger of you do it because you can. Um, Cassandra gives you a tool that will just do it. You can keep adding nodes, you can keep storing as much data as you want. And that's fantastic. But the question is, the question from management is, is there a reason? Is there a business reason for doing so? So what are the lessons learned from this? Well, I think we could have done a better job at keeping the business informed. Pre-launch and just after launch, we were, we were tasked with increasing the resilience of our platform, and that's one of the other reasons we chose Cassandra. So it ticked those boxes, but what it perhaps had is we were making, we were making decisions that had trade-offs. So we were trading off kind of the ability to query easily for this increased resilience. And perhaps we didn't communicate those as clearly as we could have done to our management team. So that's one thing that we probably could have done better. Um, another interesting point is singing from the same hymn sheet. I don't know whether, that's, uh, whether American people understand that for a turn of phrase, but, but basically we had one of our um, very senior engineers in the company, one of the founding engineers. He wasn't 100% sold on Cassandra. Uh, he, he, was, he, was, um, he was unsure that the, advan you know, the, the advantages we're going to get from it outweigh the disadvantages. And I think we've just proceeded anyway, really without getting buy-in from him. And then when business concerns would surface, that kind of lack of consistency within the development team would potentially exacerbate the problem. And probably what we should have done, and this is probably me, I should have made more of an effort up front to get all the people on board you know, amongst the development team. And I don't think that would have been that hard if I'd have actually put the energy into doing so. Um, it's just that I didn't. And then finally, kind of provide solutions. I think we should have, we should have invested time and effort up front in, in providing fundamentally an ad hoc query interface to Cassandra. And I think that would have, would have kind of headed off a lot of the perception from management that this thing's not queryable. And I don't think that would have been that hard to do. So we should, have, we should have sort of provided those solutions probably from day one. And what we could then have probably done is turn the, um, the kind of graph from earlier into something that looks a bit more like this, where we're saying, you know, pretty much everyone, if you can query SQL, you'll be able to query Cassandra. So that's, um, that's something we'll be looking to do. So to kind of wrap up,
At Halo, we really like Cassandra. We like the solid design principles that it's founded on and the fact that it's designed to be distributed from day one. I think that's a really important point. We like the HA characteristics and the easy multi-DC setup. They're kind of the two killer features for us. We don't have an enormous volume of data. We don't have an enormous volume of read and write requests particularly. But what we do have is a, is a need to run on three continents and a need to run something that is going to be very resilient and reliable. Um, and then the simplicity of operation, I think it's easy to overlook that, but Cassandra for us has been very, very easy to operate. We haven't really had to put any energy in at all, perhaps to our detriment. And it's kind of, you know, that's the long term, that's the cost you're paying every week. You're, you're, you know, you put a database in, you've got to maintain it, you've got to operate it for years. And that simplicity, the fact that all the nodes are the same, a homogenous cluster, there aren't many moving parts, that makes life a lot easier for the ops team. For successful adoption, I think it kind of boils down to, uh, to not many things. It boils down to having someone internally who's going to kind of sell a dream and get everyone on board, get the developer who isn't 100% sure, convince them up front. Get everyone to learn the fundamentals. You know, when people join the team, have a way of teaching them about Cassandra before you throw them in the deep end. You know, stop them shooting themselves in the foot. Invest in tools, that's something we should have done. I think that's an important point for Cassandra adoption. Developers are used to, you know, when you're building your software, you can just kind of, you know, execute queries to get stuff out, to see how it's running, to debug it. And with Cassandra, it's, it would have been useful for us, I think, to have those tools up front, the kind of Hadoop integration to be able to do batch analytic queries. And then finally, keep management in the loop. Make sure you're explaining the trade-offs of the decisions you're making. If you're adopting an OSQL store, it's not all going to be positives. You know, every decision you make is going to have trade-offs. So just make those clear up front. Say we're making this decision for the right reasons, but these are the things we're going to be giving up. You know, potentially a, a more widely used and ex people have experience with in terms of SQL. We're going to be giving that up to get these other things. So the future for Halo. Um, we're going to continue to invest in Cassandra as we expand globally. We've got big plans to, um, to, to launch you know, hundreds of cities next year. We're going to hire some people, I think, to, to look at Cassandra specifically. I think we're probably at a point in our, in our, kind of, in our business now where we, we need someone who is an expert in our company. You know, as we start to rely on Cassandra more and more, as it becomes our primary data store, we're going to want to have those, those skills in-house. So we'll probably start to recruit that person soon. We're going to focus on expanding our reporting facilities. So this comes down to kind of really the, bat, the batch analytics side of things, giving people back those tools to be able to answer those questions quickly and easily. And then finally, in terms of the business, um, Halo have got aspirations to extend our network. So our network of one million consumer installs with this kind of virtual wallet. So we want to extend that beyond cabs. Cabs is like the step one. We're going to move into other areas. Um, and we're going to continue to hire the best engineers in London, NYC, and Asia. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi, I was wondering, you mentioned you didn't have any uh, plan right now for doing analytics, but there were several ways that maybe you were thinking about. Can you expand on that? Sure. So the question was about the analytics side. I think what, what we're, the main thing we're thinking is that we need to be able to execute arbitrary queries against our Cassandra data store, um, and that'll probably take the form of Hadoop. So we've already got, we're already using Akunu, which gives us the kind of real-time business-focused analytics for things like in-app. So when a driver might look at their stats within our, within our driver app, and that's powered already, we've got that sorted. What we need is the ad hoc tool, the ability for someone to just to, you know, how many, how many of this do we have, where, this, that, and the other. And really, the two approaches, as I see it, are either we go down the route of, of kind of a home-baked solution, something like, um, you know, trying to integrate Hive or Pig with Cassandra ourselves, so fundamentally Hadoop, or we could just buy DSE and use that. So I, I don't know which of those two we're going to do yet, but we'll be evaluating 
uh, the kind of th those two those two ways of working, I think. No, yeah, that's a good point. Um, a nice loaded question there. Uh, so yeah, the, the question was about how, how you would arrange the topology. And, and the way we would do it is we would, we would have another data center. So where we've currently got three, one in Europe, uh, America, and Asia, we'd probably have another one in London. Uh, and we'd replicate probably just one replica to that data center. So we'd have a complete copy of all the data in one data center, and that would be used solely for reporting and analytics. So what that means is that when we're running these batch jobs that have got very different kind of read and write workload to uh, you know, the operational side of things, we're not going to be impacting our performance. Um, so that's kind of the, the, way, the, the generally accepted way of doing it, and we'll be looking at going down that route as well. Just worth saying, in a few weeks, you'll be able to do completely ad hoc queries in a, in a Kunu in, in a SQL-like fashion in the next release. So uh, that will give you a bit more flexibility. OK, so now we've got three options to, to, to test. <laughs> Any others? Uh, two, two questions. Uh, first one is about the, uh, both about backup. Uh, was, what, what was the requirement for backing up the SS tables? Was it a, a management thing of you must keep all the data just in case something happens? Um, and how do you how do you test recovery of of the EBS snapshots? Okay, so they're, they're good questions about backup. So I think I think there is some nervousness uh, amongst management about Cassandra. I think that's one of the main reasons we're running on EBS rather than ephemeral. There's that kind of that potentially irrational fear that if all of our nodes stopped, if we stopped all of our nodes in AWS and then brought them back up, uh, we'd have no data left if we were on ephemeral which is a slightly absurd view, but, but that's kind of one of the driving forces between EBS. In terms of the backups, um, I guess, yeah, disaster recovery, what if we introduce corruption? What if we accidentally delete all of our records? So we, we wanted to keep kind of historical snapshots really in time so that we could go back a week, a month. Um, and with, with the EBS, we can do that. It, I think our backup solution is relatively caveman, and I, I, I think it's something it's one of those areas that I think we need to improve upon. Um, but yeah, the, the, the plan at the moment is to, is, to, is to just snapshot all the SS tables and copy them, copy them somewhere, you know, EBS. In terms of recovering, at the moment, we don't really have a neat solution for that. So I know Netflix are always, uh, you know, they, they test this effectively all the time because they kind of use their backups as their reporting platform as well. So they kind of use the backups to restore a new cluster to do reporting on. We've done two exercises um, in, our, in, in kind of a year at Halo where we've kind of said, right, let's, let's test this. Let's see if it, we can actually recover data. Um, and both of those exercises were positive, e.g. we were actually able to, you know, fire up a brand new cluster from the backups. But it was, it was a very time-consuming process to go through that, which is why we've only done it twice. And I guess there's, there's a sort of hope that, you know, that it will keep, if we did it today, it would work, but we don't actually know that. So I guess it would be nice to have something kind of automatic, perhaps, that you could sort of press a button and verify that it's all working. Any other questions? How do you plan about going to, um, to balance your clusters? So you showed that some of those nodes were more used than others. Um, what would be a typical approach for that? So the reason, the reason our stats cluster was so imbalanced was partly because I think some of the compression hasn't fully taken effect. So, so there's kind of some of the nodes haven't, haven't quite got around to that. Um, yeah, so the, um, the, the imbalance in our cluster isn't to do with our data model. It's not like we're storing everything um, you know, under one row. Some people, you, every now and again, you find someone who's kind of got a data model that stores everything under three rows. And they have a 10 node cluster, and they wonder why it's not very well balanced. So we don't really have that. What we have is kind of a, uh, I, I, effectively all we really need to do is, is um, finish the compression, make sure that's fully, fully done, and then run repair. And you know, m make sure all these inconsistencies. So all the data will be streamed from nodes where it needs to, to make sure all the nodes have all the data they need. And theoretically, once we've done that, it should look a bit more like our other cluster, which is pretty, pretty well balanced. Um, so it's, pretty, it's basically just run repair, um, pretty much.
Okay, well, you can grab me after if you, if you want to chat about Halo. Um, thanks very much.